Hello everybody, welcome back to our living room again. We are here drinking our tea because it's day four of a dry January with Kelly. Well, it's dry for me, it's like mildly moist for you. So far it's completely dry. <laughs> so see. probably stay dry. I apologize, but I did not put on a bra for you people. A glass of wine. Nor did I put on my makeup. Okay. But I was we gonna, I was gonna say you can't tell. <laughs> uh, uh, <Yeah. laughs> um, but anyway, we wanted to address a lot of people keep asking about the the distance and the miles and are are we doing enough miles and why is it timed based and not miles based? And so we wanted to address that. So Lee is going to right. explain some things to you here. First. Yes, start keeping track of how far you get and what your average pace is on your long run and compare that to what the cutoffs are in your intended race. And remember, you taper for a race. You don't taper for training, nor should you. So don't panic when you realize that you were tired after 18 or 22 miles at a pace that you think you need to hold for 100 miles. But do, do track that and look at what your pace is. Also, there will be some assigned runs that have minimum distances, but not now. Why? First, people tend to try to do their assigned miles no matter what. When it's incredibly muddy or snowy out and the footing is horrific, it's a lot, lot more work. If you're still building up your stabilizers and you're out there running where your coach cannot see you because I cannot personally come run with all of you, you're gonna destroy yourself. You're gonna need an injury because you're trying to hit a mileage number or you're gonna give up running the trail and go do laps around the parking lot or go bail out onto a towpath or something that is nothing like your race courses you're gonna be on just to get the miles. I've seen a lot of people go, I have to hit this number. And so I can't do this loop because this loop is muddy right now. It's too hilly. I won't be able to, I won't be done by one. I have to be done by one. The, the gods of the weather know when it's race day. They do, they do. And it's gonna snow so and there's gonna be mud and wind and horrible conditions. Race directors are gonna lie. There's gonna I be like creek bad crossings. Weather. Carmel Sorry. loves bad weather. It's true. Okay, okay. go ahead. <laughs> I like it to a degree. It depends on how bad. Anyhow. You need to be trained for all of that, and the people who try to hit only a exact number of miles, no matter what, have a lot more trouble when the race conditions become not optimal, and they do it a really, 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 really lot. Also, there are routes I can run in order to get those miles faster. We have a park that has a towpath through it. If I want to get a 20 miler done or a 22 miler done and do it in three hours or less, I can go run the towpath. No problem. None of my races have stretches like that. You may sign up for a race that has that. Whole different conversation. This isn't even necessarily the optimal training plan. I'm not the optimal person to explain that, although I have some suggestions. Don't do that. Okay, so for trail running, maybe I go out and I decide that I want to do this other route. It's muddy, it's hilly, I'm more sore on the hills than I expected because it is the day after hill repeats. And so I wound up doing 19 miles instead of 22. But I'm out there a whole extra hour. I get twice the muscle work, is way more tiring. That is gonna give me more benefit on race day. And so knowing that from experience, from having tried to hit mile numbers and having trained with people who are hitting exact mile numbers and either wrecking and injuring themselves by trying to hit those numbers no matter what the conditions were that day, because it isn't the race day. Yeah, you have to finish the race no matter what, no matter the conditions. But you don't race every training run. Your training run is to get you only a certain amount destroyed so you can continue your next week of training, right? Okay, so because you don't know what it's going to do on race day, you need to train in all the conditions and you need to worry more about your amount of time that you're out there right now. I was telling them in some of the threads how like when we first started doing long run together, I would constantly be like, it's not enough miles, but I wanted like 23 miles today. And you'd be like, oh, we did four and a half, I'm good. And I'd be like, but the miles. And not you had that there to. won't be some six or seven hour long runs. They, they will happen. Just right. Not yet. If you do them before you're strong enough for them, you will get injured. Yes. Well, we did some longer ones too, but I think it was like when you set out for four and a half hours, once you got to four and a half hours, you were done. And I was still like, but the miles, this isn't the miles I want. I heard so you had, you had to convince me. I had to, a bunch that, of different. To let, to let go of that. Needless injuries and damages in my first couple years as an ultra runner. Just needless. And they were from things like that. Lack of lack of enough hip strength and uh, IT band problem, foot ligament problem, uh, hip up, pelvic upslip problem, that was fun. Pelvic upslip and rotation sucks. My SI joint has to give. Anyway, 
So next, why when most prop, most most training plans say spend this time of year building all of this base? Don't do your speed work. Build base. Here's the thing about that. Why aren't we doing that? This is very, very intentional that we're not building base volume. I know it's painful to people that are used to it, but I have to look at my notes. I'm trying to stay organized. What we're doing is we're trying to make your body actually capable of doing quality workouts at a higher volume. Okay? What most of these base building programs do is up the volume, up the volume, up the volume until you're borderline broken. And then when you are, then try to address the brokenness while also adding speed work. I don't know if you know this, but when you're borderline injured from high volume, adding speed work is not going to make you uninjured. It's not. It's also, you're not going to be able to do effective speed work. When you do these intervals, you need to be healthy. You can't pound out good intervals when you're not healthy. So this is really intentional. We're trying to build muscle cells. There's mitochondria in there, technical things. They're like little energy powerhouses. They make your energy happen. And the quality of those varies and it decreases with age and it decreases with sedentary lifestyles and it increases with exercise. Very high intensity intervals. And there's also transmembrane proteins that help your recovery. Uh, without going into deep detail, there's a lactate shuttle that sits in your muscle cell membrane. It's super important. You get more of them when you do high intensity intervals. So what we're trying to do is get you the highest quality muscle cells and then also the most stability throughout your hips and, and legs so that your joints can stay healthy that we can get. I'm trying to get that up to a very high level. And then when we build volume, you're gonna have a body that's capable of doing it without getting injured. People are gonna tweak things, but this is gonna lower your risk a heck of a lot. So we're trying to build a stable strength that can do all of this volume. And also you're gonna be able to do it at a higher pace because we've made you much more efficient. Sorry, I'm grinning because she has a notebook off to the side and it says, Monday, rest your butt. Mm. Oh, I'm very in mature. February, there's going to be a two-week training block. The first week is going to be higher volume. The second week is not. You get to pick which two weeks you want to do it. If you do the most miles you could do and it does get you over 60 miles that week. And it does still have hours on the weekend for your long runs because I want you all to put these on trail. I don't want you all trying to go, oh, I didn't get those miles in quick. I want you to just have fun with it and run out on real trails, even if that means hiking more, even when it slows you down, because that's going to be of more value. Your long run, I could assign you distance intervals, but I also, again, I don't know all of you, and the thing about intensity is there isn't a distance that's intense. There's an amount of time you can sustain intensity for. For some people, that's 500 meters. For some people, that's 300 meters. I don't know how fast you run your two minutes or your three minutes or your minute and a half. It's going to be real variable. So... That training block is coming. And it has six running days in it instead of five. And it doesn't even have real intervals that week or hill repeats because this got a whole bunch of volume. Then the week after that has cutback intervals and a cutback long run and some short, easy runs. So you recover properly, but hills come back. And then you go back to regular training. So don't worry. Don't worry. There's going to be, and that's going to happen. We'll have probably each month we'll have one higher volume week where your rest week needs to come the week after that, you can pick when in the month you put it, and you can even put it on a month borderline as long as they're spaced out. A lot of that is because I'm not coaching individually. That would be far too time consuming, but it's coming, I promise. So the only other thing I'll add, I don't know anything about membranes or lactate shuttles, but what I do know is, um. For me, when I was trying to up my distance and go up to just a marathon, that's all I wanted to be able to do at the time, I was using one of those plans where it was just a bunch of junk miles and I got myself injured and I got myself sidelined for about six months. And Sorry, you've probably heard me say this before, but I'm going to be a broken record on it. Uh, that's when I discovered the strength training and that's when I decided as I started to get back into running and be able to run just a couple miles at a time, that that's why well, I was gonna trade for the 100 miler. Um, it, people said it couldn't be done in a year's time, but doing the strength training, I did it. So just training for a marathon with a junk miles plan, I got hurt, but training for a 100 miler and going from three miles is what I was reduced to, to the 100 miler and it ended up being 13 months. I had no injuries because I was doing the strength training and I wasn't doing all the junk miles. 
So this stuff actually you would have worked sooner, except for that horrible case of treadmill. Well, yeah, I, it would have been a, one year exactly, except for mm -hmm. that DNF, know, which terrible. we're going to talk about. There's going to be a whole other video. On, a foot on, care on, kit: how to make your foot care oh, kit and avoid trench foot. It was it was a combination of calories and the trench foot. But, oh my oh, yeah, God! Yes, mm -hmm. there will be videos on these things. But on the long run video, which go back and watch. There's a discussion of how to practice your calories on your long run. And then I have to start reminding people, don't eat breakfast. Have coffee if you have to, to poop. Some of us need our coffee in the morning. I am a coffee addict. I accept that about myself. Have your coffee. Get in your car with a bottle of water. Have all of the things you're going to eat in your running vest. Do not run without calories. Go there with no calories and start running right away. If you walk the first 20 minutes of long run because you're snacking, yes. Do that. And this is another reason we're time-based. Your long run is to learn how to do 100 miles. It's not there as a, as a borderline tempo effort. We're not part of the two-hour marathon project where you have to hit these exact time goals. You're not trying to Boston qualify. You're trying to get from the beginning to the end of 100 miles of trails. Still upright, hopefully in charge of your body functions, and hopefully with most of your skin intact. That's, that's, I mean, it's the reality of it, okay? So you start on no calories so that you will have to practice. And then you try to get 250 calories an hour for your whole long run. So if you have to walk break to put them in, then you do. Then now you know what's going to happen in your 100-mile race. Which is why you're doing long runs starting sore, okay? We're worrying about the speed and the strength during the week. You're doing long run on sore, sore legs. And now you're going to try to do it starting with no calories and putting them in as you go because you all have to figure out if you get much under 250 calories an hour, come mile 50, 60 of your 100, you're done. In a 50K, when you fall under 200 calories an hour, and lots of people do, and I'm not talking about the crazy keto people that don't eat bread, barely eat fruit, and don't drink alcohol. Good for you, I can't even speak to it, but we're not them. Ooh, the storm's coming, that's my watch alarm. You probably can't storms hear Storms are brewing. And the barometric pressure change. Great. It goes off all the time. We live on Lake Erie. So it's the leading cause of DNFs. People overpace and then they stop eating or they just don't realize there's a calorie deficit. And they go, oh, for five hours, that felt great. Yes, but you were under eating for all five hours. So hour six, you are going to burn out all of your burnable glycogen. In a marathon, it's less of an issue. You do sometime around mile 22 usually. The glycogen's gone. That's that wall. Some people it's more like 19 or 20, just kind of depends on your pace and efficiency. In a hundred mile, you're slowed down, so it takes longer. In a 50K, you're slowed down on trail a little bit, so it takes a little longer, but that's those walls. You burn out your usable glycogen. It's not there. When your blood sugar crashes, you have become two years old. I know most of you have kids who get exposed to We're gonna to have like a whole video on nutrition. Too. We are, so. but again, practice the nutrition on the long run. Don't worry about the distance. Worry about being out there a long time and learning to put calories. And when I first started trying to train for 50K, I could barely take a sip of water and keep going. I was terrified. I Learning how to even get in like two gels on a four hour long run. Actually, no, I remember trying to get in like a gel on an hour and a half to two hour long run because I first started running, that was far for me. <laughs> I signed up for a 25K, horrified out of my mind because at the time, I also signed up for my first 15K, which was like 10 miles, which was gonna be the furthest I'd ever run, which was the beginning of 2010. When okay, I learned how to eat. I'm pretty good at it now. Well, actually, no. On our nutrition video, we'll learn that I actually am horrible at eating. I can get in liquid calories, a lot of them. You too can have 6,500 calories of roctane during the course of a 100 mile race. Okay, more on that at a later time. All right, so we got all your bullets, right? We got all the bullets, and then we, we like long introed and rambled. I hope they actually there was watch a lot it. Of that. That's okay. More videos. If anybody has more to be on a treadmill, watch us when you're on the treadmill. We'll break them up. For attention spans. Make your kids watch us. You know, whatever. I don't think we're that entertaining. I think we swear. We could be a punishment. I think we swear way too no, much. No, no, I said heck. I said heck in this one. Yeah. For if, that. Oh, if you have like a mouthy 12 or 13 year old, make them watch our videos if they don't act right. We'll be like a punishment. True story. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night.